welcome to this event uh, today. We have a webinar uh, basically brought to you by BenQ Europe. And I would like to just spend a few minutes just introducing myself. I am, of course, very happy to be here. I want to thank BenQ for inviting me to do this uh, webinar. And also, I would like to thank the many people that have responded online on all social media platforms about this webinar. Thank you so much for your support and uh, can't wait to share what I have today with you. I can see that we have around 173 people signed up right now. So this is going to be it's going to be good. Uh, please feel free to uh, ask whatever questions you want. Uh, of course, don't forget that uh, we're going to be answering the questions at the end. So stick around. We have a lot of cool stuff to show. So definitely stick around. Uh, well, first of all, um, for those of you who don't know me, I am a director and a visual effects supervisor. Uh, my name is Hugo Guerra. And uh, sorry about the silly photos. <laughs> I do a lot of travels and I always try to do silly photos all the time. And um, I am from Portugal. A uh, very little tiny country in uh, the south of Europe. If you ever have the opportunity, you should definitely visit. I'm originally, I was born in Porto, a very lovely city if you want to visit. Uh, of course, this city is mostly known by their amazing uh, Porto wine. My experience, uh, I've been working for 20 years in the industry. Uh, it's actually 20 years this year since I started in '99. I have worked at the BBC, I've worked for the BBC, I've worked for Nexus, for Jellyfish, I've worked for a long time for The Mill in London, and uh, currently I'm working uh, with Fire.Smoke and also with Hugo's Desk, my own company. Um, majority of my time here in London, I do live in London at the moment, was working at The Mill. While I was at The Mill, I was the head of the Nuke compositing department, and I was also a visual effects supervisor where I would be on set quite a lot of times. And I supervised or led uh, almost 100 productions while I was there. I was there for almost five years. Um, I split my time between being on set, supervising, sometimes directing, sometimes uh, working uh, with other directors as well. I also film quite a lot of short films and film my own productions as well. And of course, it's always been a split between being on set and being on the machine, working in compositing, editing, grading, and so on. Um, and of course, always scratching my head, trying to figure out how to solve certain things on set. I've worked lately, I've kind of left the commercials industry, and when I left the mill, I started working with the games industry, which has always been my passion, and I have done uh, trailers or cinematics for all these companies so far, and these are some of the games that I've worked uh, in cinematics and trailers, the two last ones being a live-action trailer for Warhammer Vermintide 2, which is not out yet, it will be out next month, and the last one was a trailer for Far Cry New Dawn, which I'm currently doing some disconstructions on my YouTube channel. I have also have a second life of teaching. I usually teach on quite a few universities all over the world and a lot of online facilities as well, ranging from the Norwich University of Arts to the Animation Workshop, Restart, National Film Television School, Scape, Foundry, FX PhD, so Editor, CMIVFX, and Campus I-12, and of course Hugo's Desk as well. Um, I also talk a lot. Uh, maybe if you uh, are going to be at FMX this year, I will be presenting at FMX. I have two presentations to do, so if you want to join, please come and say hello. I will also be presenting at the VIEW conference this year as well. So if you uh, are there, please see if you can find me and say hello. And, uh, you know, so my life is kind of divided between visual effects and teaching uh, and doing a lot of presentations like the webinar what I'm doing right now. Um, also, currently where I'm sitting is uh, my, my desk. It's Hugo's desk, which is basically my uh, home studio. My home studio is basically where I control all my productions and I have quite a lot of people working with me remotely all over the world. I have a very robust remote pipeline. In this, in this uh, uh, studio, I also have quite a lot of monitors from BenQ. Um, they've been a very good partner for me. Um, and, of course, they help me to produce the best content possible, especially their 10-bit monitors. Uh, I basically, just to give you, for all your geeky, more geeky people out there, these are the specs of my workstations. I have a Mac Pro 6.1, 
completely specked out with um, you know M2 SS cache drives and uh, basically call digit uh, rate systems as well. And of course, I have to help me with. I have three other Mac Pros completely specked out as well to help me on the farm together with another two Mac Mini servers to help me on a render farm. Um, the other side of the Yugo's desk, and this is a very important thing that I always like to share, there's always another side, which is all the books and references. I always would recommend everyone to buy as much reference books as possible. I have a huge collection of art of, basically books of art of films, art of video games, and a lot of uh, books about visual effects, a lot of books about really good uh, uh, directors of cinema. Uh, so I always try to keep a big, big collection of that. It's a huge exp inspiration when I'm actually working and trying to figure out things that I need to do. Um, also have my, my Tally Awards there upstairs on the stage. This is usually how I work, of course, not as lit as you saw there. I usually tone down the lights quite a lot so that I can work uh, in peace and have a lot more dark environments to do my final gradings. Um, this is just me working. As you can see, I kind of use BenQ monitors for both desktop and reference. So I usually tend to use a PV monitor for my desktop. I tend to use an SW monitor for my reviewing, especially if I need to do HDR. And usually that's the, the thing that I tend to do, use them as reference monitors in 10-bit using a Blackmagic card uh, converting SDI to HDMI. If anyone has a question about that, we can definitely talk about that later. Um, and for you to know, like I, that's what I mean. Like I use the PV series, which is specifically created for the video post-production. I use them for my desktop so that I can have a proper 10-bit Rexon Zone 9 display to use on DaVinci and Nuke and Photoshop and After Effects and, and all and, and all these applications. I also use the SDW, uh, the SW series, uh, photography series to both use in photography, but also to review and preview HDR and also to preview Rex Sensor 9 as well and sRGB. Um, currently, I'm going to do a little bit, a little bit of a plug here. If you check out my YouTube channel, I am currently reviewing uh, the two new de designer monitors that I have now that BenQ sent me to review. So I'll be posting a review of the, the new PD3220U, which has really new, new, really cool features like 100% sRGB, 95% P3 color space, and HDR10 content as well. But Enough of that, let's just join in, join and jump into the workshop. Um, so this is what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we're gonna go with an intro, which we just did. Then I'm gonna talk really briefly about caching. We're gonna talk about AUV setup. We're gonna talk about thinking like a 3D artist. We're also gonna talk about UV projections and geometry. Talk a bit about depth of field setups, speckler driven glows image-based screen transparency, wrapping up the, the thing, and then do a keynote at the end. Please make sure to leave your questions inside the question so that I can read them and we can have a really nice Q&A at the end. I would love for you to stay and stick around until the end of the show so that I can ask as ma answer as many questions as possible. Really want to, this to be an interactive session as much as we can. So let's just jump into Nuke. I'm going to stop this uh, keynote here, and I'm basically going to jump, jump into Nuke directly here. So let me just uh, do that. So um, today we're going to be talking about a specific shot. This is from a cinematic trailer that I uh, directed uh, about almost two years now. It's I think it's an hour, a year and a half now. Uh, this was a cinematic for a game called Heroes Arena. Um, and these this is shot. This is shot 590, and I do know that you are not seeing it in real time, but you know, um, I can stop and do frame by frame. Th this shot that we're going to be re reviewing today is basically a shot where this main character called Goral, he basically is getting ready to jump against the camera. So he's basically putting himself in a fighting pose. And then there's a lot of rain as well to make it more dramatic. And then, of course, as he gets ready to the battle, he then flies off against the camera. So this shot was completely rendered using Redshift. Uh, I'm a big fan of Redshift, especially because Redshift, of course, um, is um, basically uh, uh, Redshift is like a GPU accelerated um, uh, render engine, which is really good because then if you have uh, really fast uh, Titan cards, if you have really fast Quadro cards, you can render them really quickly. So this was rendered separately, and I'm going to just show you, and this is something that I'm going to start with, uh, really, what I want to talk about. 
Um, basically, we tend to, both at the mill and also at Fire.Smoke, we tend to separate certain layers. Um, and of course, um, so I, I would um, say that, um, I would say that um, it's often good for you to separate layers. In this case, I have a background and I have a foreground. And of course, you're probably uh, saying to yourself, well, why do you do that? Because why don't you just render the whole thing? Well, the reason I separate those layers, uh, first of all, is because not always you can afford to do deep compositing. But also sometimes um, it's much easier to control elements like edge blurring, like uh, lens flares, m like depth of field, motion blur. It's so much easier to have the actual layer separated like I have here. I have the warrior completely separated from the background so that I can composite. Uh, normally, I always have all these layers, as you see here. Uh, I'm going to just show you this is my beauty pass, um, and I'm just going to open this up a little bit. Um, I also have uh, my global illumination. I'm just going to up a little bit so I can show you. Um, this is also another thing that I tend to do. I always render out all the different passes, AOVs that you have in CG. The reason why I do this is because I like to have control and a lot of times I'm doing commercials or game cinematics or trailers. Short, Basically the pipelines are quite short time, like we have very little time to do the, the trailers. So often we try to have as much flexibility in comp as possible, you know. So the GI, of course, and this is where I want you to start thinking a bit like a 3D artist. And this is really important. That's why I'm doing this, this uh, presentation today. I want you to start thinking about CG compositing like if you were a 3D artist. And so the global illumination, of course, is something that is driven by the GI-based render, which in this case is all the light that is bouncing off of the environment. In this case, it would be bouncing in out of this environment from the background. Then, of course, we have the refraction, which in this situation is only the eyes, because the eyes really on this monster is the only thing that is actually made of glass. So anything that would be a refraction would show up on this layer. We then have, of course, a reflection. This is, of course, really useful because then you have all your screen reflections and all your image reflection uh, of the environment and all the lights that you have. You then, of course, have a specular pass, which would be the highlight specular specularity of the scene. And this would be both for the character and also for the background. Uh, I do have an emission, and of course the emission in this situation would only be on the eyes, and then I also have an emission that literally you can see it uh, a bit later on. On the beginning you have some windows on the background as well. Then I have a diffuse pass, a diffuse pass of course being um, basically a color pass that has no reflections or refractions. This is a pass that only has color information in shadows in light. You can also have the raw GI which is really basically every single information of your global bounce light in your scene without having any shadows or any lights interacting with it. Basically, this is just the GI and it does not have the diffuse color. So you're missing the texturing of the character. So anything you've done in Mari would not show up here. And this would be the same for the background as well. And then, of course, you have the diffuse raw, which would be just the directional light. So that means that in this commonly in big production houses, you tend to separate those lights as well. So um, uh, this, of course, goes for the background and the foreground. And then last but not least, we have just the color information. This would be just the straight texture information from your CG. That means whatever you've done in ZBrush, whatever you've done in uh, Mari or in Substance would show up here with no light, no reflection, no shadows, nothing at all. Then, of course, you have some utility passes. We have some depth passes. We have some normal passes if you want to do some relighting. We have some MN occlusion, which is a bit of a fake GI, really. We have also some ID passes to just help us with some color correction. And, of course, these days, this was a year and a half ago, these days Redshift does support um, uh, basically... Um, Oh, now I forgot the name. Uh, it basically supports multi uh, IDs in one go. And so, Cryptomat, sorry, it does support Cryptomat these days. So, um, now I'm going to start by just showing you how I would normally uh, join all these renders together. I'm going to start by the main character. And this is where really I want to uh, think, make you think like a 3D artist. 
So when you have this, something like this, you want to have the power of tweaking things. You know, normally, if you look at the final render here, the reflections the mer are merged, the, re the specklers are merged, everything is merged, which means you can't really change things on the fly. Uh, and of course, I don't say that you should always change them. Sometimes you do want to go to 3D to, to try to, to um, uh, tweak some, some lighting, but sometimes you don't have time. Sometimes you really have to do it in comp. So I'm going to start by by comping my CG. And uh, one of the things that I want to convey the idea here is that all these EXRs were rendered separately. So that means every AUV is one EXR. Normally, you also have the option to make one EXR with all the UVs inside. If that was the case, then you would not have to do what I'm just about to do. But I tend to start by shuffling in all the passes I need. And the reason I do that, I use uh, basically a shuffle copy. The reason I do that, you're going to see later that this is going to be so much more powerful for you to actually shuffle in all the layers so that you can have access to them at all times. And so this means that, for example, in this situation, I would say RGBA would become, in this situation, would become my Diffuse RAW. So I would make new, and then I would say Diffuse RAW, and this would be my new pass. So that means that what started as just this image here, if I now go to my shuffle node, you basically have a diffuse raw here. So what I'm doing essentially here is I'm building up my EXR just like if it was uh, done uh, with multi-pass EXR. Of course, you could have done that in the CG render, but the reason why I would um, uh, not really recommend this all the time is because if you don't have a really fast rate system, if you have a slow network, you're going to really suffer quite a lot by having multi-pass EXRs, and especially if you have multi-pass EXRs that are... Um, you know, with deep information. These don't have deep information, but it would become really, really slow. So I'm just going to bring in everything that I need. Uh, I don't need the GI. I don't need, uh, I need the refraction. I need the emission, need the diffuse, and I do not, uh, don't need the diffuse. No, these two, I don't need it for the moment. I'm just going to like basically put all of them here line by line. Uh, and of course, after a while, you start setting these up automatically. You know, you start making templates and you start basically making all this um, so you don't have to repeat this process. Um, but I'm just going to do it really quickly here so I can show you what I mean. And I'm just like copying them all in and uh, that last, last one. Now, uh, I started copying in here, so I'm just going to zoom in so I can see. So that would be my new spec. So that would be my speckler. And then in here, I would have my emission. So this would be my emission. Sorry. Emission. And then in here, on the other shuffle, I would have my, this would be my reflection. Reflect. And then refract. And then in here, last but not least, I have my diffuse texture. So that's just like the straight diffuse. So that's diffuse text which I'm also putting up here. So now, um, at the end of this thing, as you can see here, I not only have my RGB, but I have also my emission, my GI, my speckler. So what I'm ultimately doing here is I'm constructing my multi-pass EXR. And if I go page up, page down, you can kind of see that they're all here. And this can be automated. You can do this um, through Python, and, and you can, of course, not spend the, this amount of time that I, that I did doing this. Once this is done, and the reason I did this is because then I start shuffling to build my uh, CG. So I'm going to start shuffling everything that I need. I'm going to actually bring uh, a shuffle here, and I'm going to have to like basically shuffle them one at a time so that I can build it up. So I'm going to start by shuffling out my raw GI. I'm going to start with that one, and then I'm going to just shuffle again uh, basically here. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to shuffle my um, diffuse texture. Uh, then I'm going to, of course, this would all be labeled if you would have been using, um, if you had the time. You know, you would have put backdrops and you would have done all those things. I'm really not doing that because we don't really have a lot of time. So as you can see here on my shuffles, I'm outputting uh, basically the, G the GI raw to my RGB. And I also have an alpha channel, which is the alpha channel that comes with the layer. Um, so the first thing you want to do is, because these are raw passes, you have your straight diffuse, uh, which is the t diffuse text. And then you have 
your diffuse raw which is this one here so what you want to do is you want to use a merge node and there are only two operations that you require to do multi-pass compositing you just need either um either a multiply or you need a plus operation these would only be the only two that you need so if you're handling uh, raw passes then you want to use a multiply if you want to if you're not using raw passes then you're using a plus so that's pretty much it so i'm going to start by uh, multiplying basically my raw color diffuse with my raw light and that would give me my diffuse uh, light and then i'm going to do the same thing and basically uh, multiply my raw gi with my raw color and that would give you my uh, basic um, uh, GI pass. Then I would have to plus these two together, of course, so that they would be ready for me to do it. Uh, I, mean, I am going to organize this a bit better so that we don't have uh, we have a bit more space when we are going to start doing that. So that would be your first pass. Now, remember these two layers that I left here? So these two layers I left there, I left them because um, these are the same, you know. So, for example, if I leave this one here and if I leave this one here, you see that my GI pass, I'm just going to gamma up down so you can kind of see it a bit better. My GI pass is the same as multiplying my GI by the raw. And, of course, my uh, diffuse is the same as multiplying my raw diffuse my, with my raw color. So they would be the same. The only reason I have them rendered both of them here is because I'm showing you this. And, of course, I always want to have a, I want to always want to be sure about this so once I've done these I'm now going to start shuffling uh, the rest so I'm going to now plus everything else that I'm missing here so I'm going to basically go here and now I'm going to say okay I want the, my reflections um, I also want uh, my refractions here so if I go to my refractions here and Again, like I said, if it's not a raw, a raw pass, you are basically merging it with a plus. Now, be aware that you need to make sure the B pipe is coming from the previous layer that you've uh, uh, comped. And that means that you're always doing B from the last thing that you've comp composite. In this case, it would be multiplying GI with diffuse, multiplying um, uh, diffuse with light, that gives you the total light of the scene. And then you would plus the refraction, you place the refraction. So in this situation, we are having here reflections, we're having here refractions. And then last but not least, I'm just gonna start copying this up as well. And I'm going to basically do this here. So now I am plusing the last one, which I've done refraction. I'm also putting the specular as well. And then last but not least is the emission that we are still missing as well. So I would basically shuffle the emission here. Uh, where is the emission? Uh, emission. And then I would plus that one. So now, uh, basically, this is what I have. So I started with my diffuse. Then I had my GI. Then I had my light. They became together, became two lights as well. Then I merged my uh, reflection. Then I merged my refraction. Let me just double check. Yeah, reflection, refraction, and then I merged my specular, and then I merged my refraction. So that's reflect, refract, and then this is emission. So if I now look at my original render and I look at the result of my comp, you see that I have a match. This is what we we call in the industry rebuilding the basically rebuilding the shader. So this was the merged shader coming from Maya in Redshift, and this is now the rebuilt version of that shader. Now, ultimately, what this now allows you to do is it allows you to do adjustments per shader based. And this is what I was telling you about uh, if you, for example, want to think like a CG artist. You kind of want to work. If you, for example, want to do adjustments to light, you go to the light pass. If you want to do adjustments to the, to the speculars, you want to go to the specular pass. So that's really what I want to convey here when I'm showing you this, okay? Um, so I'm going to move on because we are, of course, stretch of time. I'm already late, but I'm going to now show you uh, basically the final result of that merging so that I can kind of show you what I mean with this. Um, basically just going to open up 
the next shot. Never mind if you don't know what this is. This is basically my own pipeline. I have my own custom pipeline uh, to uh, organize my Nuke scripts. And so um, you won't find this, of course, in, um, in Nukipedia or anything. It was made just for my company. But I'm just going to open up the next script so that I can show you exactly what I mean uh, while we're waiting for it to open. I'm also going to... Uh, just a second... And the reason I opened this up is because I just showed you how to actually comp the CG passes to match the AOVs. And now I want to kind of show you how this was actually done in, for real. So uh, this is the actual script, the production script. As you see, just like I did before, this is what I start with. I start by shuffling in all the passes one by one and this including the normals the ids and everything and that means that if i look through this viewer here you can now see that i have every single pass just like if this was a multi-pass exr and that becomes really useful for later on for comping and this means that when i'm actually comping here um if you look in here i always comp the same way um, you can kind of see that I have all of it labeled here. So you can see here my GI is being multiplied by my diffuse. My direct light is being multiplied by the diffuse. And that gives me, of course, the total light. And then as I go through my script here, you see then I merge the refraction, then I merge the reflection, then I merge the specular, and then I merge the emission. And as you can see, I because I have total control over this, I tend to do things to it. So this is what I'm conveying to you like... If you want to work like a CG artist, you want to kind of work this way. So first of all, the first thing also that you do here is you want pre-multi image, and I'll show you that in a second. But uh, as you can see here, uh, for example, for the emission, I have the eyes here, which are the emission. I started with a bit of a grade. Then I have like a glow for just the eyes, which are merged together. Then I also have like another glow for the eyes. And as you can see, by the end of it, I started with a pretty, pretty much dull eyes, and now they have a subtle glow and diffuse. And the same goes with the, the specular here, for example, here. You start with this kind of specular that you have here. And then I kind of like uh, graded it a little bit and did a bit of color correction to push the highlights. And the cool thing about this, but by having it all separated, is that you now are not interfering with other passes that you might be interfering in the past. So this is what I mean when working like a 3D artist. And this is really cool because then you can work with your 3D artist together. You can actually work as a team. So that means that if, for example, he gives you the reflection and the reflections look like this, and you, for example, start color correcting the, the reflections, which is, in a way, something that is incorrect because it's not scientifically correct for you to color correct the reflections only. But it always gives you a way for you to break the comp if you need to, and then your CG artist can go back and render certain adjustments that might have happened in comp. Not to mention, of course, that people a lot of times now comp three uh, D artists comp their own shots. So that's also another reason why this is this becomes so important. Now, if you look at all of this. You can clearly see also that I have all these unpremultiplications here. And this is the cool thing about having the setup like this. I'm going to go back to my original setup that I was showing you. And the reason I, I do that, the reason you have to do that, is especially because of this. So if you if you look at the edges of your uh, character, you can clearly see that they have been pre-multiplied. I know that they've been pre-multiplied because you can kind of see a feathering on the edge. So it often, uh, it often is very important for you to always keep the pre-multiplication rules. And so if you look at the alpha channel, you can clearly see that my uh, beauty has actually been pre-multiplied. So it tends to be that it's important for you to not remember, not forget to actually unpre-multiply all my layers. So that way, if you put an unpre-mult on everything here, you can kind of extend those edges. And by extending those edges... That means now you can do any color correction to your CG without really breaking those edges. And this would be for every single pass. Now, the only exception would be certain passes that would be raw. So, for example, here you see the diffuse also requires an unpremolt, as you can see. But if you look at, for example, the GI raw or the light, the diffuse light raw, you can kind of see that they are already been unpremultiplied. So you do not want to put another unpremultiply. By putting another unpremultiply, what's going to happen is that you're basically going to double premultiply. Now, let me show you why this is important. I actually have a couple of examples here to show you. So here's an example of a simple comp. Uh, this is a comp from a shot that I did at the mill years ago. So 
you have like a green screen uh, of a person. This is actually a best way for you to, to show you why pre-multiplication is so important for CG compositing. This is our alpha channel. So this is just like a CGR, a, a CG scene. And then we basically copy in the alpha channel. And of course we do a bit of this bill and then we do a bit of color correction and then we pre-mold that image and then we merge it against the background. And as you can see here, if I look at the Smith transparent, because of course this lady has a lot of Smith transparent garden, uh, you can kind of see that the correct way of doing pre-multiplication, which is to actually only pre-mold uh, at the end before uh, and not put color corrections after, you can kind of see the edges are perfect. Now, if I show you the one on red here, which is where we actually call it correct after the pre-mold, um, this means that if I compare both of them, you can clearly see here on one, if you look at the edge of this transparency here of the, uh, of the, the, the woman, you can see that on the wrong one, we now have a black edge. Now, you probably have experienced this quite a lot in After Effects or even inside of Nuke, and this really tends to do tends to be a pre-multiplication problem. So you really want to make sure you always respect the pre-multiplication error uh, uh, rules. Otherwise, you get these kind of black edges everywhere, and this is going to happen all through your image. Now, I have another example here, which is a CG example. It's the kind of same thing. You see here, I have a character from a game as well, a trailer I did uh, uh, a few years about last year and as you can see here i start by pre unpremolting that character and unpremolting of course brings back all my edges back into the thing then i do a lot of color correction all in a row and then i do a pre-molt again by doing a pre-molt that means that i have now basically that all my color correction contained between the pre-multiplication and pre-multiplication that means that my my color correction did not affect the edge of the image and so now when I put it against my background, you can clearly see that the, the, you know, the, the fur looks correct as opposed to the incorrect version. So I'm just going to show you the incorrect version, which is this one here. And I'm just going to put it on the buffer two. And then I put buffer one on this one. So you can see the wrong one has a lot of highlights on the fur and a lot of whiteness on the fur. The correct one has the correct edge of the fur. The same goes even for other parts of the scene. If you look at the edges even a bit later here, so if I look at the sword, for example, you can also clearly see that the sword on the correct one has the correct edge, but then on the other one, it has the incorrect edge. All these things are pre-multiplication errors. And this is why on my comps, as you can see, I always start by picking up an, a layer, unpre-multiplying that layer, merging all my other layers, basically doing all my color correction. And then by the end of it, if you go in here, you see you have multiple color corrections. All these color corrections are basically color corrections done with object IDs. And once that's done, you kind of like at the end, then you finally, because you see here the edge is actually raw at the moment. It's all not pre-multiplied. By the end of it, you finally do a pre-mult after you've done every single color correction. And that's really recommended because then you do not have those situations where you have so many black edges. So I hope you've uh, understood that. Um, I'm sure we will do this more and more often on my YouTube channel. So we will we will see. But now I want to like dive into something else. Since we we are, of course, uh, rushing to time. We only have 17 minutes left on this show. So uh, I want to show you just, unfortunately, it took a bit longer than I thought. But I want to show you something else that I really like to do when I'm doing CG compositing. And this is to have the actual geometry of the CG inside the scene. Now, this can be done in several ways. Uh, in this situation, I'm using an Alembic uh, cache. So this is uh, one thing you should know is that inside of Maya, you kind of have to activate the Alembic caching because it doesn't show up um, automatically. So as you can see, having the Alembic cache means that you actually get uh, the, the, the... I'm just going to change one thing here because this is... Uh, I want to put textured so we can actually see it. Um, and that's going to give you... So as you can see, this is the full geometry from Maya and it's also animated. So if I uh, play back this, it is even textured and everything. So I bring in always the full uh, textured... Um, um, CG uh, into Nuke. And I know it's a bit heavy and it becomes a bit heavy, but there's a lot of ad advantages of this. Uh, first of all, the biggest advantage is that you can now position in space 2D layers. That means you can put 
elements behind this character. You can put elements in front of this character. You can even attach elements to it. Imagine if you want to attach some smoke or attach some fire into this uh, character. Now, the way that this works usually is that I basically go and get my texture from Substance. This is a texture from Substance. This is what we call the UV. And the UV, this is a UV that is a sequence, actually. So if I go into frame one, you can kind of see these are the UVs for the actual helmet. If I go to uh, frame two, uh, you'll see that those are the UVs for the rest of the armor. If I go to frame three, it's a bit heavy to read because they're really heavy uh, EXRs. Um, if I go to frame four, I have the rest of the armor. If I go to the other frame here, I have the rest of the armor as well. So I have a bunch of... Um, of textures that are from different parts of the character. Now, the way I usually do this is that if you want to specifically paint or do something to this character and add it in post, you can use this AUV and then basically use a frame hold like I have here. As you can see, I have a frame hold to give me that texture. I have another frame hold to give me that texture, another frame hold to give me that texture, and then I have, of course, the rest. Uh, I think there is 10 uh, texture maps for this AUV of this specific character. As you can see, it all is over with the end here. So, uh, and this is really powerful because, uh, and of course, then I use an UV tile to merge all the materials together. Now, if I, for example, want to do something, I'm just going to test this. It's not really going to be exactly what you probably are going to do on this kind of project, but I'm just going to show you what I mean. So if I now open up my roto paint and the, imagine that I want to actually write something in some part of the texture, I could do so that now, well, actually not because I should have done a roto paint. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, that should have been the one I should have opened. Let um, me just uh, close the Roto one here. Um, and I'm actually going to open up the Roto. So the cool thing about this is that now, for example, if I pick up my brush, and I know this is a bit silly, but I'm going to put on all frames. And if I now actually put like uh, lines or I draw or I paint or even I can even do Roto painting, I can do cloning, I can do all sorts of things. Uh, now this can be transferred into my texture. That means that once I load it up into my texture, if I now look at actually my texture mapping here, uh, you can kind of see that now I have those two lines on the actual geometry. This means that now these two lines could be comped uh, as a scan line render. So for example, if I do not want to have the UVs uh, visible, I just need to switch this on, which is a great node that basically switches off the, um, the diffuses and just keeps, me, keeps everything else. Or if you want, you can also add other textures as well. So for example, imagine that you want to merge uh, some textures on top or something. That also would be possible as well. So for example, if I do this now, um, you basically could see it in the scan line. So I'm just going to go into my scan line here and I'm going to switch to my scan line so that you can actually see the result of that render. Just give you a second. It is a bit heavy, so it's going to take a while. Also, maybe I have some settings. Let me just uh, remove the anatomization or, yeah, let me remove the sampling here so we don't have any high quality on the render. So, so you see... This is, of course, the two things that I just wrote. So you basically have the roto paint node that I made here with the two uh, awkward lines. But I also have like a texture map here, which is some scratches that I have here. And what I did on the final project here, actually, I used this to create this. Um, this is a render of that. And this is basically just some scratches. And you're probably asking to yourself, well, why didn't you just do this in 3D? And yes, it's true. I could have done this in 3D, but this allowed me to retexture certain parts of the CG without having to go back to 3D because sometimes it's too late. Sometimes you are in the last minutes of the production and you really cannot afford to go back to 3D anymore. So that's what you have to kind of keep in mind. And that's why I'm showing you this. Now, if I go back to my actual final comp, I can show you exactly where I placed that. So this was actually placed here. This was done for all the shots. So if I go in here, I'm just going to choose a frame that is not motion blurred um, so that we can see that. Don't forget to leave some questions. If you do have some questions, uh, I would love to know more about them. Um, at the moment, I, uh, I seem to not be able to see the questions um, myself, uh, but... Um, Maybe I can find out someone that can probably help me with how I can see the questions. But I can see that there's 15 questions asked, but I don't see the actual questions in my window. 
So maybe I don't have permission to see the questions, but I do need to find out how to do that. Um, otherwise, you're not gonna be, and there won't be any answers. Uh, so, but we'll, maybe we'll figure that out. Um, okay, cool. Yeah, BenQ is already taking care of that. So, um, so basically, uh, what hap what ha what's happening here is that I had those that scratched, and what I did is I do not comp those scratches because you see these scratches are actually not lit. They do not have any pre-multiplication. They do not have any multiplication by light because remember your texture, which is a raw texture, does not have any light. So what you want to do is you want to merge the scratches into your texture without without any without any light. So if I zoom in here, you can clearly see that I basically have some scratches coming in. I'm going to exaggerate them a bit so that you can actually see them a bit more, uh, so that you actually see them. Uh, so I'm going to basically just uh, increase them here. It's lagging a bit, you know, because I am, of course, using, uh, I'm recording my screen and doing all sorts of things. So you see, now I'm adding these these scratches. This is why it's so important for you to separate the U your UVs and reconstruct them, because I'm now screening these scratches on just the diffuse and then once i multiply it with its uh, light and i multiply it now you see that my scratches are now being correctly affected with light and uh, so if i for example remove this uh, screen operation here you can clearly see that the helmet has uh, it's very clean there's no scratches whatsoever but if i activate this I can now activate some scratches on the helmet. Now, if you look at uh, the final result of the comp, so if I go into my final script here, that just gave me the ability to have a little bit more believability, especially here. If you look at here, if you look at the final frame, the CG looked pretty clean. And so, of course, the scratches just gave it a bit more humph. You know, it just made it a bit more dirty. Uh, so, of course, this, this goes without saying that you don't need to use this just with scratches. You can also use this with textures. You can do this with dirt. You, I've used this technique with water as well, you know. So it is also possible to use it with water, not just... You can also use it with um, with particles. You, you can use it with anything, really, that you want to that you wanna, uh, project on the UVs of the CG. Uh, in fact, I'm going to actually load um, a script here in the background while we're waiting, and I'm actually going to show you that, what I mean. And while we're waiting for that script, I'm going to move on to the next topic of hand, because I quite... I have quite a lot of things that um, I want to show you, um, but uh, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about this, which is what I call uh, basically a specular, uh, a specular glows, but they are basically um, image-based specular glows. And the way that this works um, would be if we pipe this in. So I'm just going to pipe this in into my comp here. So you see, that, my, that was my rebuild of the CG. Remember, we did that. Uh, I do, of course, have to put a pre-mult here because I didn't do a pre-mult. Of course, the pre-mult, by the way, needs to be with the, with the proper alpha channel because my alpha channel at the moment, if I switch to A, you can see that the value of my alpha channel is 6. And, of course, my edges, which used to be very pretty and very beautiful are now very merged and uh, broken. The reason for that is because every single merge node here has merged the alpha channel as well. You have two choices. You can either uh, copy in uh, the raw alpha channel back into the stream uh, from like like doing something like this, or you can just uh, remove all the alpha channel merging on these merge nodes, and that will give you a proper pre-multiplication. Once I have the pre-multiplication here, I'm just going to show you what I mean with these based specular glows. What I tend to do is I tend to shuffle just the specular pass. Um, so basically, uh, what I'm trying to do here in, uh, is basically achieving, by, by basically shuffling out just the specular pass, I use the specular plus to drive glows. So this means that I have just a glow just by using the specular pass. Um, and usually I do a pretty big glow of just highlights. And then I have another glow, which would be a much more smaller glow. And then sometimes I even uh, do even more glows, like more pinpointing glows to the image. And what this gives you basically is this. Uh, by having separated glows, by having a big, uh, like a big glow with specular passes, 
with a smaller glow with specular passes and then yet even a, a really, really pinpointed glow. And this glow, of course, is using a very huge tolerance. So I'm just really picking up just some highlights. The same goes for this one, which I have a tolerance of two. What happens here, you get this kind of effect that you tend to have with cars, you know? You tend to have like an effect of light, almost like, you know, when the sun hits the chrome of a car. And if you play this back, you basically get those kind of highlights. Basically, the specular pass would be used to provoke those highlights to exist. I'm just going to cache this real quick so that I can go and show you exactly what I mean uh, when it plays back. So now that it's caching, um, I can just like go frame by frame. And as you can see here, you see the highlight growing here on the, on the armor. And these are driven by those glows, you know. So if I start here by having just the image, you see there's nothing there. And then, of course, I start by having one glow that just gives it a little subtle uh, diffuse. I then have another glow that gives us even more highlight, especially on these specks here. You can clearly see that they kind of grow with light. And then last but not least, I pick up the larger glows. And that's really a great way for you to have really nice pin glows. Uh, and again, only really possible if you separate the layers because you kind of want to only affect the specular on this. You do not want to put it on other passes that might, might not be important. Now, we are running out of time, unfortunately, but I'm just going to show you one last thing. Uh, and that last thing is going to just be what I call image-based transparency. And I'm just going to show you quickly because we don't have the time to actually construct it ourselves. Uh, unfortunately, time flies always when you're having fun. Um, so uh, I'm just going to show you really quickly what I mean here. So on this shot, we have a bunch of rain, um, and the rain is actually down here. So as you can see here, we have uh, some rain. These are particles made in Maya. And as you can see here, basically just a huge amount of rain. We also have the contact rain on top of the character as well. Basically, the rain is being occluded by the character. Now, one of the things that I don't like about this rain is that this rain does not pick up any color from the environment. And the reason for that is because it was going to be it was going to take too long to render that. So the CG artist on this project, uh, one broke house, told me like, you know, if I actually put light environment on the rain, it's going to just take forever to render. So what I did here is I faked it. So first of all, I picked up my image, which was the pre-comp, which already had like the particles. And then I blurred the hell out of it. So basically it's a huge blur. It's a blur of 200. And then I screen on top even more light from the particles so that I have a bigger source of light here. Once I do that, I then grade a little bit, I color correct, and I clamp. The reason I clamp is because I want to keep the values uh, in control. This, of course, looks ridiculous, I know. But then what you do is you pick up the rain that you got and you multiply it by that color blur. And then, of course, you tone it down. And as you can see by toning it down, now what I have is I have rain just on the color information. So now, as you can see, I have rain on the lamp of the background. I have rain being colored by just the particles. And I have rain being colored by just the sword. This is really a great way for you to actually color your particles without having to actually render everything again. And that, that really will make a huge difference on your comp because if you look in here, uh, for example, this would be how it looked originally. Uh, so you see you have like a lamp here and you have the particles. And as I put my rain on top, you can now see that my rain looks more realistic because the rain is picking up some reds, it's picking up some oranges as well. And then, of course, I still put the rain on top as well. Of course, this is a bit too much. But this is just a great way for you to pick up some blue on the rain from the environment and, of course, some green and some orange. And that's really simple. You just basically blur the hell out of the image and then just multiply that image by that the, the light background. So that's kind of like... Um, that's kind of like how I'm, I want to show you. This is the last thing I'm going to show you, although I do have another script here. Remember when I tell you that these, this kind of UV thing could also be very handy to put rain? So, for example, this is a shot I also did. Um, and as you can see here, you can kind of see that there is some water drops um, uh, uh, going through the face. This would be an incredible uh, hard render to do in CG because we would have we we had a very um, we had a very limited budget, so we couldn't really 
like spend so much money in doing proper simulation of water droplets on our face. So what you do, this is lagging a bit, so I'm just gonna like close this new script here for the moment because we we are, it's a bit heavy. Uh, recording the screen and having all these things open is always a bit of a, of a problem. But um, so as you can see here, these raindrops are basically done uh, with the same principle. So if I go in here, you can kind of see uh, where I've made them. So the raindrops are made here. So you see here, I have my UVs of her face. So this is what I have. And then what I start do doing is I start merging the water in our face, you see? So I have like this one and I have then all these. And if I now play this back, you can kind of see that what I get is I get the water droplets uh, going through the face. And then this, of course, gets rendered and um, gets rendered to the same through uh, the same UV tiling system like I showed you before. And if you just wait a second, I'm going to show you the render made already. So this is a pre, this is a render made, and so this is basically the rain drops. And in here we have rain on her face, we have rain in the armor, and we have of course rain uh, in also on the blouse as well. And this layer then would be merged on top, but of course it would be merged on top by multiplying it by the light. So. We are really pretty much run out of time, so I'm going to have to leave the Nuke scripts for the moment. Um, I am sorry about that. It's always never enough time to show everything that I want to show. Uh, but let's go back into this thing here. And I just wanted to like uh, wrap up my presentation with a little bit of a, sm a, a shameless promotion. So uh, if you guys want, you guys and girls, you can follow me on Twitter on YougoCGuerre. Don't forget that we still have the Q&A, of course. You can follow Hugo Siguerra on Twitter. You can also follow my Hugo's Desk channel on YouTube. That's Hugo's Desk. You can also uh, support my channel in Patreon if you want me to keep developing and making more free content for the internet. Please support me on Patreon. That would be very, very good if you could uh, do that. With just $1, you can actually vote on the next videos I do. So that's pretty much for me for the presentation that I had prepared today here. Uh, but now it's time to jump into the Q&A. So uh, the Q&A, for that, I'm going to basically uh, switch my camera on um, so that we can actually go through that a bit more easily. I'm also going to... Um, base, uh, so now you should be seeing me as well, I hope. Uh, I really hope so. And, and we're going to go through the questions really quickly here. So I have a lot of questions. So this is going to probably take a while. So I'm going to open up the questions. We have 55 questions. Wow, <laughs> that's insane. Um, okay, so uh, let's start with the first question. So first question just says from Antonio Teixeira. just says hello. Uh, hello there, Antonio as well. Um, I have Celine as well saying this Gandalf intro is always cool. Thank you so much, Celine. Thank you so much for everyone. So I basically have a lot of people saying hello, which is great. Thank you so much, Julian. Thank you so much, Emiliano. Thank you so much, Celine. Um, so um, I also have uh, Mo uh, asking me, saying that he has been watching my videos for years. Thank you so much for that, Mo. Um, I also have... I'm sorry if I'm butchering anyone's name, okay? I really want to make sure that I'm trying to to tell the names correctly, but you need to understand that I I don't know uh, the names as... Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to read them sometimes. Uh, so I also would like to say thanks to Jahel from Mumbai. He says hello. Uh, Julian says the video is lagging. I hope it was a bit better after I removed the webcam. Um, Siva... Reddy is asking, where can I find footage for practicing compositing? Well, you can find footage if you support. Um, if you, you can find footage uh, if you support me on Patreon, you actually have access to some of the footage that I have on my videos. Uh, so, um, um, so uh, basically, just go to my Patreon uh, and you can support there. And then, of course, if you pay the twenty dollar tier, you actually have access to some of the footage. Um, so I have a question here for Farhad. Really amazing info I learned. I was wondering why my CG comps get heavy, but rendering merge DXRs is easier, less render setup. It is true, uh, merge DXRs are easier, but um, it just becomes 
it just becomes really heavy on the network. You just have to be careful with that. Um, now, also be aware that I did not have time to go through the caching system. It's very important for you to make sure you have a really fast cache. I would really recommend you having an M2 uh, solid state uh, for caching. Uh, so I just really want you to keep mind that I usually have I have a dual M2 solid state so I can run about 2000 frames per sec uh, 2000 megs per sec on caching and if you don't know how to set up the caching in Nuke you should definitely check out uh, one of the last webinars from the foundry talked about that so you should definitely go there um I also have another question here from Farhad is it, is it a good way to merge EXRs and then re-render each pass as a separate EXR for Nuke? Uh, I guess so. I guess that could be one way to go. Um, so Mika is asking, will we be able to rewatch this webinar if it's it's done? Uh, yes, uh, BenQ will be sharing the recording of this webinar. Uh, I would probably uh, think that it would probably be at some point tomorrow. I'm not entirely sure when it will drop, but I'm sure it will be dropping very soon. Um, I have a question here from Telmo Jose, João de Souza. I'm sure, uh, yeah, BenQ tells me and they confirm that it will be tomorrow that they will be sharing this video. So I have a question here from Telmo jo João de Souza. He, he, I'm sure he's Portuguese <laughs> by his name. He asks, if it's not raw passes, do you need to use the shuffle copy or you just merge plus the passes? I think you misunderstood me, Telmo. I'm only using the shuffle so that I can include all the passes into my stream. So you still have to merge the passes. The only reason I did a shuffle copy is because this render that I have is not a multi-pass EXR. So I'm basically building my own multi-pass EXR inside of Nuke so that I can have access to all the passes. And it's very important because... If you have access to the passes, then you can actually do call a correction and call certain passes immediately. You know that is actually the most important part of the whole thing. Like, if, for example, if you want to do some call a correction in Nuke, you can then call the ID pass. Or if you want to do some call a correction that uses the only the specular pass, then you can call the specular pass. So always having a stream always helps you a lot. Uh, now I also have if I had uh, pretty much with the same question. Um, so uh, Darash, Darashan asks, what is the CryptoMat and how does it work? CryptoMat basically is a special pass you render in CG that assigns automatically a specific color to every single object and texture inside the CG. That means that you get not just the red, green, and blue image of the of the uh, IDs, but you do get a much bigger range. And that means you can really be granular with your color correction. Um, I have a question here from Ashish. Um, sometimes when we, I use to project in any texture using UV tile on Alembic, the mesh becomes transparent and nothing is visible in render. When I'm using FBX, it works fine. Please help me out. So basically, Hashish Hanjan asked this. It could be that your Alembic is coming in and your texture is coming in without an alpha channel. If you do not have an alpha channel inside the 3D system, all your uh, textures will be transparent. Keep that in mind. Um, Sean, uh, uh, Sean Fontaine is asking, why do you use frame holds on the UVs? I'm using frame holds because the UVs that I have on this project run from frame 1 to frame 10 and because they have the same names. So that means that uh, frame one is one part of the texture, frame two is another part of the texture, frame three is another part of the UV. So that I have to put a frame hold so that I can select which part of the UV I want. That's why I have to put a frame hold. Um, Davide uh, asks me, would this be available on your YouTube channel? Uh, not right now, no. The video will be shared by everyone that signed up to this uh, stream. Uh, it will be shared tomorrow by BenQ. Uh, the video will be available on the YouTube channel only later on, uh, but I don't have a timing for that just yet. William is asking, any way to see more in-depth your pipeline tool? Uh, yes, definitely. If you want to do that, you can definitely support me on Patreon. I have done multiple videos and Q&As about my pipeline. In fact, just last week, we did a Q&A session in Skype where I showed my entire pipeline in detail so people could see the shot manager. 
So William, if you want to see my pipeline, if you support me on Patreon over 25 pounds, dollars, then you can see those videos or I can talk to you about my pipeline. Um, Emiliano is asking, when are you, or, uh, when we are doing a chroma key, must we do all the adjustments and then pre molt at the end? Yes, definitely yes. If you want to do a chroma key or doing any type of keying, you want to make sure you build your alpha channel as best as you can and also remove all the color information like spill suppression, uh, using spill suppression, removing all the blues and greens from your image. And you should only pre-multiply at the very end, just like the example I showed you on the video with the pre-multiplication. Again, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to be able to go through all these questions. Uh, there's there's so many questions. There's 103 questions, guys and girls. Come on, you guys are you you guys and girls are insane. 100, 105 questions. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to just jump around a little bit. I am so sorry if I'm skipping some people, and I'm also so sorry if I butcher your name. I'm so sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to start. Uh, I started by the beginning. Now I'm going to start by the end. So I have a question here from um, Nick uh, uh, Nickley, uh, um, and they are uh, uh, asking when does one do green chroma shoot and when we do blue chroma shoot. So that's an excellent question. Um, blue screen tends to be when you have a lot of yellow on set. So for example, if you have a lot of people, blonde people on set, you don't want to use green because green is very close to yellow. So if you have a blonde, having green is going to be very difficult for you to pull a key. So usually it tends to be, it has to do with the color of the hair. Green screen is much better for brunettes, for people with dark hair, uh, or even with dark skin as well. It's much better for that. And blue is much better for lighter skin people and for uh, uh, lighter hair as well. And that's usually why they make that decision. And um, Andrea here has a question. Hi from Ecuador. Hi, Andrea. Hi from, hi from London. Uh, thank you so much for calling from Ecuador. Could you please explain how to do magic things with UVs? <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I don't really have any magic. None of this is magic, Andrea. Uh, it's all just techniques. Uh, but you should definitely check out my YouTube channel. I have a few videos about UV uh, projections. I will make more videos. So if you subscribe to my YouTube channel or if you want to support me on Patreon, you can always vote for a video like that or you can suggest my next video. So I also have, uh, oh yeah, William is just saying that he will look, uh, look at that. That's Thank you so much, William. Uh, I also have Javier Bravo here asking, um, Nuke supports UDM. Yes, it does, um, uh, Javier. And that's why you did the frame holds. Yes, that is correct. This is an UDM uh, workflow for UVs, and that's why I had to put the frame holds. Uh, thank you so much for helping answering that as well. Um, I have here a question from Lai N. Uh, hello from Bielcourt Ecole, uh, France. Uh, uh, hello there. Uh, hi, France as well. Um, she said, love your videos. Question, when we have big YXR and the video begins to bug and such, do you suggest a pre-comp or what do you do? So if you have a very large YXR, you should definitely check out caching inside of Nuke. Caching will allow you to actually pre-cache the files into a faster hard drive. So if you get an M2 solid state or if you get a really fast RAID system, you will be able to actually cache your files so that they are not read on a slow hard drive. Like imagine if you're reading them from a USB drive or if you're reading them from a network drive. That means you can read them really quick and then it will really improve your pipeline. Again, I'm sorry that we didn't have, to have time to talk about caching today, but uh, I will make a video about that soon on my YouTube channel. And I do know that the Foundry has made a webinar uh, about that, I think, last week, actually. So uh, I have Vink, uh, Vicky here, Vicky Jane, asking, how efficient is the ray, render, the ray tracer render instead of the scan line? So the ray tracer render is quite effective, especially if you want high quality motion blur, as opposed to the scan line render that is not very good with motion blur as compared to the ray tracer. So I definitely would recommend to use the ray tracer. Of course, goes without saying, the ray tracer has one problem. It is really heavy. 
Um, and I'm just going to choose a couple of more questions in the middle uh, because, unfortunately, we kind of have to wrap up, I think, because we're already running for an hour already. Um, so uh, we kind of have to wrap up. So I'm only going to choose some questions here in the middle. So um, I have uh, José here saying, uh, this was great, intense, but quick. <laughs> Sorry about that, José. Um, I also have a question. Let's see a question here. Uh, I have a lot of people saying thank you. So thank you so much for everyone that said thank you. Um, so, uh, okay. So I have a question here from uh, Xi uh, Yai Peng. Uh, how do you uh, CG shot in live action? How to match grain? So that's an excellent question. For you to match the grain, it tends to be that when you shoot the footage, you tend to film a plate of grain. So imagine if you pick up basically um, a chart for the grain, uh, and this I actually have the chart here. Um, so I actually have it here and I can even show you. So if you use something like this, which would be a gray chart. So this is a gray chart for exposure. And on the other side, you have a gray chart. So this is actually an excellent way for you to uh, match grain because you can film this on the set and you actually have a sample of the grain here. And then once you have the sample of the grain, you then can use that sampling to add the grain to your CG. This is one way of doing it. The other way, of course, could be if you use the regrain node, or if you want, you can also, uh, um, you know, do the grain by hand. You can also make the grain using the grain node, but I would not advise that much to that because it's not as good uh, as using an actual sample. You know, um, let's uh, do uh, just two more questions and then we wrap up. A lot of people saying thank you. So thank you so much to everyone. I think because I have so many questions, I might have to do a YouTube video just about these questions. I really think that would actually be very much appreciated if I go through a YouTube video answering all of these. So I have the let's since this is a BenQ um, uh, BenQ sponsored event, let's finish with a BenQ question. So I have Emilio Sapia asking, would you suggest buying the BenQ PV270? So first of all, Emilio, I have not used the PV270 yet, but I definitely would always recommend to use a BenQ monitor. I'm not just saying this because we are, of course, on a sponsored stream by BenQ, but BenQ has really high quality professional monitors. You know, most of their monitors run in 10 bit instead of 8 bit. Most of their monitors have 100% RGB, they have 100% Rexon Zone 9. Some of their monitors even have 94% of P3. So they really have a huge gamut if you want to work in high quality grading or color correction. So, um, so yeah, I just wanted to like uh, put that out there. Um, and of course, do not forget that because you are viewing this, this webinar, you do have a 10% discount if you want to buy a BenQ monitor. Uh, and BenQ, when they share with you the recording of this video, they will share with you also a special code to give you 10% discount. So don't forget that as well. Um, so I'm going to randomly choose the last question here. Um, so uh, let's just... Um, Let's just um, um, just pick one last question. I have a lot of people here saying hello from a lot of countries. And again, like I said, I am going to answer all these things on my YouTube channel. I think you guys deserve that. You guys and girls have been here watching everything. Um, so let me finish off with Rafael Martin. So he asks, hi, Hugo. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you so much as well, Rafael. My question is about attach something to geo. Like you said before, maybe a fire plate or smoke. Do you use vertices for that? Can you just give a tip about that? Yes, definitely. I do use vertices. Yes, there is a node in Nuke. You should investigate. You can go to the help file to check. So, Rafael, there's a node in Nuke called the GeoSelect. And also on the menu of Nuke, you have a little button that allows you to put the Nuke displaying vertices or displaying faces. When you select a vertice or you'd select a face, 
you can then select this node called GeoSelect and you press the button select and then you can attach the geometry to any kind of uh, axis or any kind of geotransform node. So yes, literally that is the best way for you to attach geometry to vertices and things like that. So I just wanted to like um, keep that, that around. Um, so yeah, so I think we're going to wrap up since we've been going for an hour and 10 now. Unfortunately, I think we are running out of time. Uh, I really would love to thank, I want to thank everyone for coming. I, they, I was blown away by the amount of people that were online at some point. We had um, almost 300 people at some point online. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much because the more people we get on these events, the more we can make these events happen. Like I said on my posts, I am my video ch my channel is all about sharing information and knowledge, professional knowledge without any paywalls. I would wish that every knowledge would be free to share with everyone. So because you were here, because you've supported this event, I'm sure we can repeat events like this and we can do much more. So thank you so much. Um, I also would love to thank BenQ for inviting me for this event. I love to work with them as well. And don't forget that tomorrow BenQ is going to share the video recording of this event together with a great discount for buying a BenQ monitor. So thank you so much, and I hope to see you next time on a video at Hugo's desk. Bye-bye.